What's up guys, Dr. Alex Tatum here. I have a question for you. When you hear that a couple is having a hard time getting pregnant, what is your first thought? Who do you look at first, the male or the female partner? If you answer the female partner, then you're in line with what most of the general public thinks, that infertility is primarily a female issue. But this assumption couldn't be farther from the truth. In reality, 50% of couples that are struggling with conception can have a contributing male factor. So today, let's talk about male fertility. Welcome back to episode nine of The Man Cave. So what's the story on male fertility? I actually wanna start with a quick disclaimer. There is way too much to cover on this topic for just one video. There are entire textbooks dedicated to male fertility and specialists like myself spend years learning what we need to in order to take care of patients. So this is going to be the first in a four part series. In this video, we're gonna cover some of the basics of male fertility and what an initial evaluation looks like for most patients. In our next video, we're going to get into lifestyle changes and discuss some of the medical and hormonal treatments that we use. And with our final two videos in the series, we'll talk about some of the procedures that we commonly perform when treating male fertility, in addition to some unique fertility scenarios that are worth discussing in more detail. If you wanna check those videos out, click the links in the description down below. First, let's define some terms. Fertility is defined as the state of being fertile, which means that one possesses the ability to reproduce and have children. Simple, right? Infertility, by contrast, is the state where one does not have the ability to reproduce or have children. But in reality, things are almost never that black or white. Most couples that are struggling with conceiving are actually best described as being subfertile. Although we seem to use this term interchangeably with being infertile, which I'm also guilty of. Being subfertile means that a couple's monthly chance of conception, AKA getting pregnant, is significantly lower than it should be, but isn't necessarily zero. This is very different than the term sterile, which is typically reserved for someone who has previously had normal fertility, but then underwent a sterilization procedure to drastically reduce or eliminate their fertility potential. An example would be a male undergoing a vasectomy or a female undergoing tubal ligation. The term sterile really doesn't apply when dealing with a couple struggling with subfertility. So it's important to understand how conception works and what a typical monthly chance of achieving pregnancy looks like. Let's go over the basics. When biologic females come into this world, they're born with every egg that they will ever have. This is in stark contrast to males who are continuously making sperm on a rolling basis every 74 days. Now, a female's eggs are stored in the ovaries, and after reaching puberty, one of these eggs is released from an ovary every 28 days, where it travels through the fallopian tube towards the uterus. This release is known as ovulation, and this is what provides the opportunity for conception. In a perfect world, at least when pregnancy is desired, when intercourse is had during a five-day window around this time, the male partner sperm travels up through the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and then into the fallopian tube as the recently released egg is still traveling towards the uterus. The fastest sperm then meets and enters the egg in a process known as fertilization. This newly fertilized egg, now known as a zygote, then begins a special process of cell division as it continues to travel to the uterus. This transformation causes the zygote to become a cluster of cells known as a blastocyst. Once the blastocyst reaches the uterus, it then implants into the lining of the uterus, known as an endometrium. It then develops into an embryo, continues to grow into a fetus, and nine months later, enters this world as a baby. That's how conception is supposed to happen. And for our purposes, the most important takeaway from this isn't the complex names or even the processes involved. It's that ovulation only happens once a month, and that's when a couple has the chance to achieve pregnancy. Most experts, including myself, agree that having sex every day during a five-day window around this time gives couples the best chance for conception. I typically recommend that couples start having sex three days prior to ovulation, on the day of, and then once more the following day. When timed appropriately, couples with average fertility will have about a 20 to 25% chance of conception with this approach. Ovulation prediction kits, along with tracking basal body temperature, tend to be the most accurate ways to chart and time ovulation. Now let's do the math. 
If a couple with normal fertility is reliably having intercourse during the fertile window, they will have a 74 to 83% chance of conceiving after six months of trying and a 93 to 97% chance after 12 months. That's why traditionally couples haven't been described as being subfertile until they've failed to conceive after at least a year of trying. But in the modern era with couples waiting longer and longer to start their families, seeking an evaluation after just six months of trying or even earlier could be totally reasonable depending on a couple's unique circumstances. It really is a numbers game and we have to keep in mind that fertility declines with age. Okay, so now we've defined some of the different terms that we use in fertility medicine and we've covered how conception is supposed to happen. We've also reviewed the math that's involved. But how exactly common is infertility? Infertility affects about 12% of couples. This could mean that they're unable to conceive initially, or it could mean that they've previously been able to have children, but are now having difficulty with later pregnancies. The factors that contribute to infertility can be broadly defined as being female or male in nature. Some common female factors that most couples are familiar with include polycystic ovarian syndrome and endometriosis. But there are also an entire world of male factors that can contribute to a couple's infertility as well. 80% of couples with infertility will have a female factor, 50% will have a male factor, and 30% will have both a male and a female factor. This means that male factor infertility is much more common than most people think. It's also why every male partner of a couple with potential subfertility should be evaluated, because if not, we're potentially missing and failing to treat the underlying cause of up to 50% of couples' fertility struggles. In order to achieve conception, male partners need to have a sufficient number of healthy moving sperm per ejaculation. The classic saying, it only takes one, isn't necessarily true. In reality, men need millions and millions of sperm in order to have normal fertility. If there aren't enough sperm, if they aren't moving correctly, or if they have major issues with shape, men may have trouble conceiving. The good news is that evaluating a male partner's fertility potential is relatively straightforward and non-invasive. For most men, there are three basic tests that we need to get in order to assess their fertility. Number one is the semen analysis. This is what some people often refer to as a sperm count. It is an ejaculated specimen that is collected via masturbation in order to assess how many healthy sperm there are using a microscope. Typically, it's preferable for this to be collected in the doctor's office to make sure that the specimen is fresh and healthy, but it can be collected at home under special circumstances. And because there can sometimes be significant variation between specimens, at least two separate semen analyses are needed to accurately assess male fertility. It's important to note that in order for a semen analysis to be accurate, men must abstain from ejaculating for at least two to seven days prior to collection. And by two days, we mean a full 48 hours. So for most men, I tell them just to wait three days. If you're planning on getting a semen analysis anytime soon, make sure to plan accordingly. The second test is a blood draw to check certain hormone levels. Hormones are chemical signals, and the ones that we check are used by the brain to communicate with the testicles in order to stimulate proper sperm and testosterone production. If we know that a man doesn't produce any sperm, or very little, we may run some special genetic tests in addition to a basic hormone check. Finally, the third test is a comprehensive history and physical exam. We want to talk to couples and hear their story. During that discussion, we'll see if there are any clues about what could be causing their current struggle. Afterwards, we perform a brief physical exam that includes a testicular exam. This is to rule out any lumps, bumps, or other physical findings that could affect fertility. Now, if you're a patient, please don't worry. This exam is non-invasive and shouldn't be a source of anxiety. It's no different than getting a hernia check in high school. After those three basic tests have been collected, we typically have a good idea of where someone's fertility potential stands. Occasionally, additional tests may be required, but it's usually at this point that we can grade a man's fertility. So let's talk about that. How do we grade a man's fertility? What is it numerically that makes one man better or worse off than another? Trying to simplify male fertility to this level is admittedly a little reductionist. The truth is, things are much more complicated than that. But there is a number that we use to roughly rate where a man's fertility potential stands. This number is known as the total modal count, or TMC for short. This is a value that is calculated from a man's semen analysis results. When a semen analysis is performed, there are several different values that are reported. The three most important of these are volume, concentration, and motility. Volume is simply how much ejaculate there is. Is there a little or a lot? This is reported in milliliters. Concentration tells us how many sperm there are in each milliliter of ejaculate. 
This is usually reported in millions per milliliter. And finally, motility represents what proportion of sperm are healthy and moving. This is reported as a percentage. Although each of these values are individually important with their own respective normal ranges, what's even more important is how they relate to each other. Remember that the only sperm that can achieve pregnancy are healthy swimming sperm. And we can calculate how many healthy swimming sperm there are in each ejaculation by multiplying volume times concentration times motility. That's the number known as the total modal count, and it is the most useful single value for assessing a man's fertility potential. Again, this is admittedly a gross oversimplification, but generally speaking, the higher a man's total modal count is, the more fertile he is. So when we treat male fertility, what we are often trying to do is raise a man's total modal count as high as we can. The total modal count can then predict what will likely be required for a couple to achieve pregnancy. Broadly speaking, there are three methods for a couple to conceive. The first is regular natural conception in the bedroom. The second is intrauterine insemination, also known as IUI. And the third is in vitro fertilization, also known as IVF. There are a lot of reasons why a couple may need to undergo IUI or IVF, but in the case of isolated male infertility, the need for either of these is often determined by his total modal sperm count. These thresholds are often debated, but they're worth reviewing. Starting off, most men with a total modal count of 20 million or more should have a reasonable chance of conceiving naturally with timed intercourse, provided of course that there are no female fertility factors at play. Now, men who haven't been able to conceive naturally but have a total modal count of at least 10 million are usually candidates for IUI. IUI is when a man's ejaculate is prepared through a process known as a sperm wash and placed directly into his female partner's uterus at the time of ovulation. This gives the sperm a head start and can help couples achieve pregnancy even with relatively low sperm counts. It is worth knowing that the sperm wash process itself will decrease the total modal count compared to a regular semen analysis. So in reality, most fertility specialists prefer for men considering IUI to have a total modal count a little above 10 on a regular semen analysis. Finally, Men who have a total modal count that is less than 10 million will often need in vitro fertilization or IVF in order to conceive. IVF is when a single sperm and a single egg are combined in a lab and allowed to develop into what's known as an embryo. This embryo can then be transferred back into the female partner's uterus in order to achieve pregnancy. IVF is a fantastic tool because it can allow even men with critically low sperm counts to conceive. But as we progress through the different options for conception, things can become more expensive and invasive. IUI is more expensive and invasive than conceiving naturally, and IVF is more expensive and invasive than IUI. So by raising a man's total modal count and actually treating his subfertility, we can reduce the burden of care required for the couple to achieve pregnancy. For example, a man who would have originally needed IVF to conceive may, after treatment, potentially improve his counts to the point that IUI or natural conception is now an option. I hope this video has given you some context on fertility in general, how conception works, the basic male fertility evaluation, and how we grade male fertility. Please join us in our next videos to learn about male fertility treatment. Remember, up to 50% of couples struggling to conceive will have a contributing male factor. So guys, if you and your partner are having a hard time conceiving, I encourage you to do your part and get checked out. It's quick, non-invasive, and the right thing to do. If you'd like to come and see us, check out our website at www.indymenshealth.com or call to make your own appointment today at 877-362-2778. Until next time, this is Dr. Alex Tatum, signing off.